Okay. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Should we prepare and ask the Fa our Heavenly Father to guide us in this study as we prepare to open his word and look to understand that which has gone before us for our time. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we need to rely upon you to understand that which is recorded in scripture for our time. We need your wisdom, but we need to be willing to come before you to ask for your guidance. May your angels attend us today. Help us to understand. Guide us so that we make application according to your word. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to understand. Guide us in the paths so that the applications that are made are ready so that we may understand that which is going to happen in the coming days. Direct us in these paths. Help us, for we are weak. We do not have your knowledge, and we need it. Be with us now. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. What's the purpose of this study? What's the purpose of the study that we've been doing every Sabbath morning for the last several weeks? Well, the, well, the purpose, at least my understanding of it, is that God is calling us to come into covenant with him. And so we've been examining their covenants um, and their symbolism in uh, mostly the minor prophets, but it's brought us uh, all over the Bible. Okay. To whom is the book of Malachi presented well that's to the levites and so if it if it is presented to the levites is it also not presented to the priests yeah well they're levites as they're included in the levites so we have specific admonitions within the book of malachi that are written more for our time than the time in which they are written yeah, like Malachi 2 verse 1 says, and now, O ye priest, this commandment is for you. So you can see it's directly, uh, that part's reject directed to the priests themselves, specifically. Okay. Now, in Malachi 2, are we also not shown that there is a warning that the priests at that time had done something that they should not have done. Mm -hmm. Are they not told to remember the wife of their youth? Mm -hmm. So does this not imply that those priests have accepted a wife that is not the wife of their youth? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now, part of the reason for this conversation today, and this is more of a conversation than it is a direct study, is to put together some definitions using crudence and using scripture to help us delve into a portion of the Bible <clears throat> over which there's quite a bit of question and consternation. The more I look at this, the more I'm led to look at this, the more I am seeing evidence for our day and questions that we're going to have to be asking. Okay. Now, well, 
Well, okay, just uh, can I just kind of sum up uh, a little bit here? So, so we had looked at the Levite and the concubine, which you're going to be studying here, right? We're going to get to it, yes. Yeah, and um, there was some discussion outside of the study of when this took place. And um, so you're going to address that point. We will, we will eventually get to it, yes. Okay. Because it's it's going to be very important for us to to understand and consider. Yeah. Yeah, this this is just one of those passages of scripture. You know, you don't normally do a presentation, a sermon on it. Um I know that uh um there is um you know, in reading the Bible every day to kids, generally you're going to pass by some chapters in the Bible. And this would be one of them. Now, why is that? Well, it's because it's pretty graphic. But I used to read it to my kids. But uh, okay, but it, it's pretty graphic. But you, you know, I, I recall that when we were doing the, the studies in Ezekiel, that there were some portions of Ezekiel that made you very uncomfortable. Well, it's just yeah. There's things that I don't like. The pretty evil things. Okay. Right. Just very graphic. The Bible can be very graphic sometimes. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's just. Okay. Well, before you are the definitions that are taken from Cruden's Concordance. Now, this is not yet complete. We're going to deal strictly with the definitions part of the definitions today. And then we're going to get into a portion of the book of Judges, starting with chapter 17. <clears throat> now, concubine. This term in scripture signifies a wife of the second rank who is inferior to the matron or the mistress of the house. The chief wives differed from the concubines. First, in that they were taken into fellowship with their husbands by solemn stipulation and with consent and solemn rejoicing of friends. They brought with them dowries to their husbands. They had the government of their families under and with their husbands. And the inheritance belonged to the children brought forth by them. Though the children of concubines did not inherit their father's estate, yet the father in his lifetime might provide for them and make presents for them. Thus, Sarah was Abraham's wife, of whom he had Isaac, the heir of all of his wealth. But he had beside two concubines, namely Hagar and Keturah. Of these, he had other children, whom he distinguished from Isaac and made presents to them, as polygamy was sometimes practiced by the patriarchs and among the Jews, either by God's permission, who could rightly dispense with his own laws when and where he pleased, or by their mistake about the lawfulness of it. As this was their practice, it was a common thing to see one, two, or many wives in a family, and beside these, several concubines now does god dispense with his laws no right so in this cruden has an error and it's an error that we don't accept <clears throat> now according to cruden David had seven wives and 10 concubines. Is this correct? Are you asking rhetorically or biblically? I'm asking biblically. No. Okay. Thank you. As I put this list together, and this is the list of the verses that Cruden used. We go through and we find out that his eldest son was Amnon, 
of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Ahinoam was his third wife. His second oldest son was, was Chileab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. His third son, Absalom, the son of Macaw, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. His fourth was Adonijah, the son of Haggith, who was his fifth wife. His fifth son, Shaltiah, the son of Abital, his sixth wife. <clears throat> his sixth son was Ithrium by Elga, his seventh wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Now in 2 Samuel 20, verse 3, and David came to his house at Jerusalem. And the king took 10 women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house and put them inward and fed them, but went not into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living in widowhood. But of these prior four verses, we've addressed his second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth wives, and his seventh. What wives are missing? Well, Bathsheba is one of them. Didn't mention her name. Right. Um, hmm. I'm drawing a blank. Dwight, can I don't see what, what you're looking at. So I see Judges 19 in front of us on the screen. Interesting. So you're looking at the, so you need to reshare. Okay. So just a moment. Yeah, because, yeah, we're. I was trying to figure out where you were reading. So you're reading from this paper called Concubine. Right. Is that now on the screen? Yeah, that's on the screen now. Yeah, thanks. My apology. <laughs> okay. The wife that is missing is Michael, the daughter of Saul. Was that not David's first wife? Mm-hmm. Now, we know that David and she had no children. So here we have a situation. We have David having eight known wives and 10 concubines, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we ever find a, you know, something important about the number 18? Yeah. Is this a detail that we should be looking at? I don't know here. I can't think of any significance here. Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything in my notes about 18. Okay. Now, 1 Samuel 18, 27. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines 200 men. And David brought their foreskins. And they gave them in full tale to the king that he might be the king's son-in-law. And son gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. Yeah, so interesting. Kind of an interesting payment for a wife, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely say yes. Now, 2 Samuel 12, 24. And David comforted Bathsheba, his eighth wife, and went into her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and called his name Solomon. But Solomon was the seventh in line for the throne, and he was the eighth son born. That's a small detail that I don't think that we, we address very much within the Bible. 
Okay. So how how do you der- derive he's the so oh because um the first child of Bathsheba died. Right. Okay. So if you have the eighth, here is Solomon, the eighth son, that's definitely not in keeping with the way that Jacob dealt with his sons. Yeah. So So, I'm just interrupt you here. So you were, you were asking about the 18th, but I think the more significant thing here is the seventh and the eighth. Okay. Um, And Jeff dealt with this quite a bit, especially later on. Right, like the seven and a half years being eight. Right. Um, So, but we also know in the context of what we've been studying Friday nights, the seven heads and the eighth, um, that there could be some symbolism here. Right. That. So, in the situation with this, here is Solomon, the eighth son. He is definitely number eight. He is the youngest, and he is of the eighth wife. Okay. Well, yeah, David was the youngest too, his sibling. Right. Wasn't he the seventh son, though? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, seventh son. Now, when you look and when Crudence looked at this out of Chronicles, the list that is used here gives a very different set of names, but it still is in line with whose son was whom. So in 1 Chronicles 3, now these were the sons of David, which were born unto him in Hebron. The first was Amnon of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitis. The second was Daniel of Abigail, the Carmelitis. So why the difference in the names? Because here he is called Chileab in 2 Samuel, and in 1 Chronicle, he's called Daniel. Hmm. It's obviously a, a name difference, uh, but Samuel's and Chronicles are two different authors, aren't they? I think well, I one Chronicles was in a, a list of priests that did this as far as uh, chronicalizing what went on. Okay. Was, it not the, was it not the priest's obligations to do this? Well, I, I believe it was Ezra that, that did quite a bit of this with Chronicles. Okay. So. Yeah, Ezra put together Chronicles. But, um... Because it, at that point, Ezra was definitely of a priestly line. Yes. My point. Exactly. So. First Chronicles 3, 2. The third was Absalom, the son of Macaw. Did, did we just address that question? Why the different we, names? We didn't. I'm interested in, in what people's thoughts are. Why would there be such a difference in the name for the second son? Um, can we go back and, and check for the meaning of the name in the beginning and the name, the begin, or the meaning of the name, uh, the second name Certainly. that was given? Certainly. So, if we do this, we're going to come back up here to 2 Samuel 3.3. Now, as we turn to that, and I'm using a different computer to do this, so I'm keeping the screen the same. As I look at... 2 Samuel 3, 3, one party is trying to say that that this name, Chileab, is the same as Daniel. As the same as Daniel? 
Yeah. It's, it's not the same in Hebrew, so I'm not right. sure. I have my strongs open. It's, it's Kiliab or Chiliab means restraint of his father. Okay. What'd you say? I'm sorry, Angela, I didn't hear that. Restraint it, of his father. Yeah. It actually means like, like his father. Uh, okay. Strongs is wrong there. Okay, so this son, Shalab or Daniel, with Daniel meaning God is my judge, and Shalab being like his father, is this a foreshadowing of David with his coming to grips with his sin? with Bathsheba that we find in Psalm 51? Where David accepts God as his judge and does so very publicly? Could be. I mean, it, it's not uncommon for people to have more than one name. Okay. You know, a name that uh, sort of a nickname or the name that's actually his real name um like, uh, Israel has two names or jerusalem has two names too well more than two names but yeah yeah ariel yerushalayim uh, yep. Satan. um okay. and, uh, and other things but uh it, it's possible that that his name caleb Chileb, however you would say that, would be Kileb, um, would just be because he looked like his father, that that would be the name that they called him, the one who looks like his father, rather than Daniel. Okay. Daniel's not likely to be a nickname, where like his father is more likely to be a nickname. Okay. Any other comments on this, on the name? Do we know when uh, it was Samuel that wrote the book of Daniel or the book of Samuel, or who do we know that, that wrote that? Was that another conglomeration from a priest? We don't know. Okay. I didn't think so. Well, the, the likelihood that second Samuel was written by somebody else is, is fairly good since in first samuel we record the death of samuel yeah we just don't know yeah, who i would believe that okay so as this continued the third absalom the son of Michal, the daughter of tamal the king of geshur the fourth was adonijah the son of Haggith. The fifth, Shep Hattiah of Abital. The sixth, Ithrium by Elga, his wife. Now, if I go back up here, I think pretty much all of that is the in same. line with the, with the exception of the second son. These six were born unto him in Hebron, and there he reigned seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years. And these were born into, unto him in Jerusalem. Shemaiah and Shobab and Nathan and Solomon, four of Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel. So Bathshua or Bathsheba had four children, with Solomon being number eight in the line for the throne. Ibhar also, and Elishama, and Eliphelet, and Nagoa, and Nepheg, and Japhia, and Elishama, my 
Why would that be repeated? What are your thoughts there? Because the spelling is the same. I don't know. Never looked at that before, so. Because if, if you look at First Chronicles 3, 6 and First Chronicles 3, 8, you have two names being repeated in these lines. And then the last verse here, these are all the sons of David beside the sons of the concubines and Tamar, their sister. So we're giving, given a list of, of all of these sons. And I find it intriguing, again, that <clears throat> it is <clears throat> Solomon. <clears throat> from Bathsheba that is the one that succeeds to the throne. Mm -hmm. Why would that be? Uh, Here we have... Didn't David tell us why? Well, what I'm, I'm saying is here you have Amnon, right? <laughs> now, wasn't Amnon the one that sought relationships with Tamar? The sister? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I believe that's who it was. And Absalom <laughs> attempted to overthrow the throne. I'm sorry about the background. No, you're fine. Absalom attempted to overthrow the the throne, right? Yeah. Yep. Now, was it Adonijah that sought one of David's concubines? I think that was who it was. So. I'd have to go back and check for sure, but I think that's, I think you're right there. Okay. So we have all of these different situations that we can look back in other portions of scripture because a relationship between a brother and a sister was not something that was to occur in Israel. Uh -huh. The son such as Absalom attempting to overthrow his father was also something that we weren't supposed to see in Israel. You might see this in Egypt. You might see this in Babylon. You might see it in Greece. So you're counting these things as disqualifiers. Yes, I am. I agree. I'm presenting them as disqualifiers for your consideration. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> Solomon had 700 wives who all lived in the quality of queens and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. We find this in 1 Kings 11 verse 3. So the first three verses of that portion, but King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and the Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Now, his son Rehoboam was only marginally better. First Chronicles 11.21, 21, 
And Rehoboam loved Michal, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines. For he took 18 wives and threescore concubines and begat 20 and eight sons and threescore daughters. There's that 18 number. Yep. Plus we have three score concubines. So here we have a total that he was married to of 78 women. He had 28 sons and 60 daughters. So you have a doubling, 88. But it's interesting to me that Rehoboam, Solomon's son, loved Makkah, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines. <clears throat> Wouldn't Makkah have been his aunt? I mean, this is one of David's grandsons, a son of Solomon, who is said to be in love with the daughter of one of David's sons. So one of David's granddaughters. So, yeah, I guess he would be in love with his aunt. So, we wind up seeing a very convoluted situation in this definition of concubines. <clears throat> the final comment that Cruden made, but ever since the abrogation of polygamy by our Lord Jesus Christ, and the reduction of marriage to its primitive institution, the abuse of concubines has been condemned and forbidden among Christians. Now, my question is, are we going to see this? Most Christians. Most Christians. Okay. Okay, and this is, this was pointed out in the chat, correction, that the daughter of Absalom would have been Rehoboam's cousin. I stand corrected. Thank you very much. I was trying to figure that out too. It didn't make sense that it was an aunt. Okay. Good point. Now, we're going to delve into some portions of scripture. We have this definition and these verses as part of our background. But now we're going to delve into this next section. And we're going to look at it because we're going to look for what could be symbolic for our time, for what could be literal, and for meanings that we need to seek for our definitions today. <clears throat> so. We're going to bring up Judges 17. I spent some time going through this in the 1769 Bible, so all of the alternate readings will be on the page before you. There's going to be questions that are going to be asked. I want to know what your thoughts are as we're going through this. Judges 17.1. <clears throat> and there was a man of Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah. What does Micah mean? He is like God. He is like God. Let us, as we're going through this, consider the actions of this man. Judges 17.2. And he said unto his mother, 
the 1100 shekels and shekels is grayed out, it's in italics. And what does that mean for us when we're going through this in the Bible, when we find something in italics? Well, it's just an added word. Okay. And he said unto his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and spakest of also in mine ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Now, what is he admitting to here? Theft. Yes. So, given that this is occurring in the book of Judges, was the covenant of the Lord and specifically the Ten Commandments known by those that were then in Israel? Repeat that, please. Okay. Repeat that question. <clears throat> Was the covenant that was given by God in Exodus 19 and <clears throat> the commandments that were given in Exodus 20 were those known by those that were then in Israel? Uh, well, they were supposed to have known them. Okay. So was this man living according to God's law if he had stolen 1,100 shekels of silver. Negative. Was he honoring his mother? Negative. <clears throat> and when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. So his mother was going to give this 1100 shekels of silver to her son to make a graven image and a molten image. Is this in keeping with God's commandments? No. No. <laughs> okay. I'm finding this story to get kind of intriguing. Now. Yet he restored the money unto his mother and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. So they were in the house of one who is like God. Did we not have that definition for this man's name? Yes, that's what that's what we just learned. So, in other words, here is a man whose mother has provided for a graven image and a molted image, and they place these into his house. Now, Every time I've ever seen the, the name of a city called Bethel, I recognize that that means the house of God. So this is a man that is accepting that he can set aside the law of God. His mother is making it happen. So his mother is giving a representation of a church. 
stating that it is all right to have graven image and molten images in this house. So it's all right to set aside the law of God. Well, um, that's the premise of the other guy. Right. All, all I'm doing is I'm looking at, at how literally I can look at this verse. I'm not saying that I accept it. I'm saying that this is how they're looking at this. And there's a reason that we're using this portion of judges today. Well, it, to me, it's just a, it's just an indicator of things to come. Okay. I, mean, I, I see exactly what this story has panned out to be, you know, over the centuries or the millennia. Okay. <clears throat> but I don't understand the significance of it. I mean, other than it's telling you this story. Okay. And I don't mean, I don't recognize the significance. I do recognize the significance because of all the symbology in it. Okay. So symbolically, woman is a church, right? Correct. Now, whether it be his mom or his, his wife. Okay. <clears throat> False doctrine and such. I'm sorry, what, what did you say? Let's say uh, represents false doctrine and such in modern church. Okay. Is there something symbolic about 1,100 shekels? Well, the 11 jumps out immediately. So you have 1,100 shekels of silver, and then the mother takes 200 shekels of silver to give to the founder, the one that's going to melt to make the graven image and the molten image. So is this, is this 200 in addition, or is this 200 as part of the 1,100? Is there something symbolic about that? I mean, let's let's consider something. <clears throat> yeah, I think the eleven, the two hundred, is associated with the eleven hundred. Okay, a shekel was being defined as being 220 grains, English grains of weight. Right. Okay. So, comment from the chat. They went from having 1,100 to 900 shekels at the setting up of the image. Is this not potentially giving us 911? Oh, great catch. <laughs> now this, this, this is thanks to others in the chat. So it is no, a great catch. I, I know whoever, whoever ran, yeah, that, uh, that makes sense. <laughs> so here we have a situation to consider. that this was in the house of Micah, one who would be as God. Is that not what we have been seeing from the church in the last many years, that they believe that they are God's representative on this earth? Well, that's the claim. Yes, definitely. That is definitely the claim. Now. And Pope does the same thing. Agreed. So when I looked at this with Genesis 17.3 and I come down to an alternate reading, I'm told to look 
to Exodus 20. Because in Exodus 20, thou shalt not make thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above and that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. That is Leviticus 19.4. In those three verses, is our Heavenly Father not being very specific to those that would say that they were following him? Yeah, there's no way of making any of them or making mistakes about that. Okay. In the book of Isaiah 46, 6, they lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and hire a goldsmith and he maketh it a God. They fall down. Yea, they worship. If this is in the house of God, are we to worship a molten image or a graven image? That question again, please. <clears throat> if this is in the house of God, are we to worship either a molten image or a graven image? Are we not told that this is not to be done? I mean, we just finished reading that from Exodus. Yeah, there, there's no, no, there's, there's no um, validity to bending down the knee to molten or graven image. Yet I find it very interesting that at Adventist Southern University, they would choose as they, are teach, as they are training teachers and ministers and conference workers, that part of their curriculum was to send them in to a room to bow down before an idol. Are you serious? I am very <laughs> serious. No parent? Went wacko on that one? I was, I was at a meeting with a brother that had attended at Southern and he made it very clear that in order for him to graduate, to receive his degree, he was told he had to go in, he had to bow down to an idol. So he left the university without receiving a degree. That's upstanding actually. It is. But it's also shocking that this is the type of curriculum that we are finding within some of our schools after 9-11. Oh, none of that stuff surprises me, actually. Not well, to mention spiritual formation and contemplative prayer and all that. I, I was... Sorry, 17.6 sort of answers that question, doesn't it? Okay, please read. Uh, in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Right, which is going to be a, a point we're going to touch on here very quickly. And there's a reason that that verse is there. That sounds like why it would be there. <laughs> well, okay. We'll read 17.5 first, then we're going to touch on 17.6. And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Now the alternate reading says, and the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and filled the hand of one of his sons who became his priest. Is this not what we're seeing today that 
there are many ministers that come out of these schools that are here only for their compensation. Are, are there, there any? any? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Okay. Now, I know myself personally, you know, you got to eat, bro. <laughs> and, and that's a driving force in a lot of us. Is God not able to provide for us? Absolutely. Most definitely. All I'm getting at is that when we are provide when we are looking to a man as a leader, as a teacher, as a priest, <clears throat> we'd better be finding that they are living and obeying the entire word of God. So this man, Micah, consecrates one of his sons to be his priest. Is that in keeping with God's order? Was Micah a Levite? Of course not. Wasn't he a Levite? Micah, okay, if we go back to the first verse of this. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose, man was, whose name was Micah. Does it oh. say that he was a Levite? No, no. I, I, thought he, I thought that's what I read earlier. That was the, actually the line above it I was reading. Right. I, I understand. And that's what they put in the current Bibles today. Now, and is it in, in Hosea where it says Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone? Right. Now, the verse that Brother Tom referred to, Judges 17.6. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. When I looked at this, when I was considering this, we actually find this occurring several times within this portion of Judges. Yeah. And, and just a note there, as you see in your notes, when you look there, See that funny little symbol in Judges 17, 7? Okay. The word and? Yes. That means that the next, this is another section. So that, in those days, there was no king in Israel, applies to those first six verses. Okay. <clears throat> and then this, the funny little symbol for the paragraph? Yeah is basically telling us that's another section. It's another, another reading for us to go on to. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, when it goes I'm, on, it goes when, on from uh, that to the next one of those little funny signs that you're calling them. I don't know what th that thing is called. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what it's called. It's a paragraph marker or a reading marker. Um, so. Now, when I'm going through this, using the 1769 Bible, Judges 17, verse 6, they give us the footnotes to say that Judges 17, 6 should be compared with Judges 18, 1, and Judges 19, 1, and Judges 21, 25. Four times we have the following. Where's that in the margins, you said? It's in the margins. I have it on the screen before you right now. Okay. So these are all to be combined. So my, my comment and my question, if this is the way that the translators looked at it, 
could we or would we agree or disagree that these sections 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21 should all be taken as one grouping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just a note. Okay. So you look at, at um, chapter 21, notice it's the last verse. So again, they're going to put this um, at the end of a story, yet in 18 verse 1, uh, they put this at the beginning of the chapter, but really it applies to the previous chapter. Okay. So that, so this is something that instead of putting it at the beginning, as we would when we're telling a story, they're going to tell the story and then put this at the end of the story. Does that make sense? I agree. I'm asking the question if, if we cannot see this as a, a parenthetical marker that yeah. all of all of this is bringing it all together yeah for the sake of argument yes yeah okay so the the question's been raised in the chat uh should we include deuteronomy 12 verse 8 what does that say to us Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. So is that not a commandment of, of God that we are not to do what we see is right in our own eyes? Because the following verse says for ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the lord your god giveth you so, excuse me that was just uh somebody was unmuted okay so in other words here is Moses making it very clear you are not to do the things that you are you shall not do after all the things that we do here this day every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes for ye are not as yet come into the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you so if we are not yet come into the rest and the inheritance, what's being referred to here? But you mean the time period? No. What is the what is the rest? They have not yet come into inheriting the land. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So this is before they crossed the Jordan. In Deuteronomy chapter 12. 12. Yeah. So, <clears throat> in this situation, this portion of Judges is combined with the others as all being one story. It's all one grouping of symbols for our consideration today and it's all all um events really prior to the period of the judges proper it's, i would agree it's, it's in the period of the time when after joshua has died okay we're, we're going to be comparing a lot of this and we will come to the proof on it as we continue through here mm -hmm. But I'm in, I'm in agreement with what Theodore just said. Now, starting the new section. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. And he sojourned there. 
Here we have an identifier. What does Bethlehem mean? House of God or something in that nature. No, that's God, Bethel. God's house. That's Bethel. House of bread. House of bread. House of bread. What bread are we seeing in this situation? Leavened. I would agree. So we. <clears throat> we have a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, because there's more than one Bethlehem. This is Bethlehem of the nation of Judah. And he is of the family of Judah. And it says that he was a Levite. How can you be both of the family of Judah and be a Levite? Do you have an answer for that? Anybody have an answer for that? Could he have been a fake priest and was just called a Levite? Okay. That's a possibility. I'm sorry, what was that? Intermarriage? Is that what you said? Fake priest. What's that? Fake priest. Yeah, he's of the tribe of Judah, but he's acting as a Levite. Oh, yeah, that would have been, that's, that's, yeah, fake. Okay. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, in making his way. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah. And I go to sojourn where I may find a place. Now I'm going to read the alternate reading to Judges 17.10. Both are now before you. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me. And be unto me a father and a priest. And I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year. And a double suit. And thy victuals. So the Levite went in. Here is this Micah. Has he not filled the hand of his son and made him a priest? Now he says to this man of the family of Judah, who was a false priest, dwell with me, be unto me a father and a priest. I will pay you. I will provide your clothing. I will provide your raiment. What is the garment a symbol of? Well, that's your character. Your righteousness, isn't it? Well, it's supposed to be. So here is. I apply it to character because, you know, it's either white or it's not. Right. Spotted, basically. So <clears throat> Micah first sets his own son up as a priest. Now he's got someone else coming to him saying, I'm a Levite. And so Micah changes his allegiance from his son to someone that tells him something and wants him now to be a priest unto him. 
What does that say to you about Micah? And what does that say to you about this Levite from Judah? Well, Micah's not living up to his name, for one thing. Uh, and so that now puts him in the category of the ante, doesn't it? I would say it puts him in a category of the Antichrist, sure. I, I mean, if we're looking at this as a, you know, we're trying to figure out the, the, the symbolic logic of all this and, and where the story is, who's the story directed to and what it's all actually all about. You know, is this, and I'm assuming that you're trying to put this, defining this into our time? Certainly. Okay. My thought, anyway. Um, it's, it all seems relevant. It's all, it's all speaking to, to what's going on actually, or what has been going on with Micah. <laughs> right. Who we're going to possibly identify as the, uh, the church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Is that what you're, is that where you're going with this? Well, I don't know that we could identify it yet as being Babylon, but I can see that since this is Mount Wait Eastern, a second, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, I never said Babylon, I said, I know, I said I know. SDA I, church, and, and we know the SDA church is not Babylon. The SDA church is not Babylon, I agree, but Babylon is also Rome. Yes. I'm not saying that Micah is representing Rome. And can't we say, uh, if we enlarge into that, can't we actually say Rome is actually the world? That would I mean, be a it is Egypt. We're, we're taking all these symbols and kind of intermingling them. And <laughs> but we're, well, <laughs> we're identifying well, Egypt as the world, right? Okay, I would agree. And, and we're identifying Rome as its own entity, but it's also part of the world. Isn't that why the, the, the woman rides the beast? Okay. But in this, in this situation, we're dealing with Micah of Mount Ephraim. And we're dealing with one that is of the family of Judah that claims to be a Levite. Right. So we're not dealing with the world. Well, could the Levite be the SDA church then? Why, I mean, what, what I'm saying in this situation is the two together. The what? The, the, the two together, Micah and the Levite. Yeah, okay. Are representative of the SDA church. Would that make sense? Yeah, that, sound, that combination sounds correct. It's something that's palatable. Okay. Okay. So, as we go on. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Now, when I looked at this, the marginal reading for consecrated, we come down here and we go Judges 17, 5. And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and filled the hand of one of his sons who became his priest. So in other words, this man believes that he can consecrate his son and a man from Judah to being a priest. Can a man consecrate another as a priest? No. Only in the papacy. 
and it's still fake. All right, agreed. Now, <clears throat> then said Micah, now I know that the Lord will do me good, seeing that I have a Levite to my priest. Where is Micah's faith being placed? In his, In his understanding? Is I mean, it's, 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 we know that the written word had contradicts what he's thinking. But it's in his own, he's doing whatever he wants. Wasn't that, that, isn't that that day when they were, there was no king and every man did whatever they wanted? Isn't that what we're seeing today? Yes. Because we have no king. Well, king, Christ is supposed to be our king, but Christ is not the king of most Christianity. You know, it keeps, it keeps reminding me of the story of Cain. It's self-righteous so-called works versus faith in God. All right. Here again. Then said Micah, now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing that I have a Levite to my priest. He is trusting in the righteousness of man mm. for his salvation. I agree. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's what everybody does. They trust in man, not, you know, it's what he says. It, you know, it's my way. Trust in me. Now, that concludes Judges 17. It's interesting to me, when I go through this step by step, that this story is being given for our admonition today because of how many things we are seeing that are again occurring in this section but we're seeing them occur all the way around us. So, we're going to go on. Do we now have Judges 18 in front of us? Is that what's on the screen? 18.1, I see at the bottom of the screen. Good. Now, what's up in the italics are the paragraph breaks that are given in the 1769 Oxford Revised King James. From verse 1 to verse 7, we're going to be addressing the Danites. They're going to be searching through this area. We're going to have quite a few things we're going to have to look at that are going to pertain to Micah. So, Judges 18, verse 1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. So as we stated, 17.6, 18.1, 19 and 21.25 all taken together are showing us that all of these chapters are part of one great story.
Now we come to this on the, on the tribe of the Danites. Book of Joshua, 1947, at the bottom of the page. And the coast of the children of Dan went out too little for them. Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against the Leshem and took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and possessed it and dwelt therein and called Leshem Dan after the name of Dan, their father. But we're being told here in Judges 18.1, that they sought an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day, all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. <clears throat> had Dan taken the territory that had been allotted to them? I believe here the answer is no. They took only part of it. Any we need thoughts? to go back to the story. Okay. I mean, to prove it out. Sure. Okay. So, if we went to Joshua 19, what would we find? The beginning of that chapter gives us the inheritances for Simeon, for Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali. If we look at Joshua 19, verse 40, it states, And the seventh lot came out for the tribe of the children of Dan according to their families. And the coast of their inheritance was Zorah and Eshtal and Urshemesh and Shabalin and Ajalon and Jephthah and Elon and Timnatha and Ekron and Eliketh and Gibbethon and Balath and Jehud, and Benibarak, and Gathrimon, and Mejikaran, and Rakan, and the border before Japho. Now, there are some cities that are named here that were Philistine cities. So Dan is being told to dispossess the Philistines. And the coast of the children of Dan went out too little for them. Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against Leshem and took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and possessed it and dwelt therein and called Leshem Dan after the name of Dan, their father. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Dan, according to their families, these cities with their villages. <clears throat> and the children of Dan sent of their family five men from their coasts men of valor from Zorah and from Eshtael to spy out the land and to search it. And they said unto them, go search the land, who when they came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah, they lodged there. So what are the Danites doing right now? What are we being shown that they're doing?
They were sent as scouts, as spies, but why in the world would they want to lodge with Micah? Are they not going into the areas that other tribes had already conquered to see what what land they've that they've achieved here they come to this mica and they're lodging at the house of mica which means they're staying with him right So they have come to Mount Ephraim to a house that has gods, molten gods, and silver gods. So that brings us back to Genesis 49, 16. Okay. And, and 17, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. So Dan is treacherous, although he's also appointed as a judge to judge his people. I guess there's repentance for Dan or some of them. Okay. How many judges came out of the tribe of Dan? Anybody know? No, I, I, I got to go to my notes. I remember taking notes on this, though. Okay. Would it surprise anyone if Scripture has recorded only one judge that came out of the tribe of Dan? Well, wouldn't surprise me, but <laughs> now who would that be? I'm trying to remember who that is. All right. <clears throat> the last judge that is listed in the book of Judges is a man named Samson. Samson. Yeah. Samson, yeah. He is the only one noted as coming from the tribe of Dan. Who was now known for being uh, opposite of what God was. Okay. So. <clears throat> that story starts coming in a lot clearer now. All right. Now. Judges 18.3. When they, the children of Dan, were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite. And they turned in thither, and they said unto him, Who brought thee hither? And what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? And he the young man, the Levite, said unto them, the children of Dan, thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. Now, what can you say about this young man, the Levite, in revealing this to the Danites. Is he not revealing things to these spies that he should not be addressing?
So if we look at the alternate readings, the margin readings here, <clears throat> we know <clears throat> that Micah has hired him. He's being paid 10 shekels of silver per year. He's being paid a double suit. And he's receiving his food. What's important about the double suit? Are we not seeing a doubling here? Well, yes. In other words, here is your garments. Here is your righteousness. I'm giving you double righteousness. So double of a man's righteousness is still filthy rags. <laughs> yeah. Double of nothing is still nothing. Okay. Judges 18.5. And they said unto him, ask counsel, we pray thee of God, that we may know whether and the priest said unto them, go in peace before the Lord is your way wherein you go. Any thoughts on, these, on this portion of Judges 18? Does this sound familiar? If we then take a look at the margin readings, 1 Kings 22.5, and Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. And the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go battle against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord beside that we might inquire of him? Woe. Now, Jehoshaphat, was he known for being a good king? No. He was. Second, Corinth, Second Chronicles 20 is a marvelous. Okay. So Jehoshaphat is asking the king of Israel to inquire of the Lord, but the king of Israel and his prophets are saying one thing, and Jehoshaphat is recognizing that this is not of God. Would you agree? Yes. So we continue with that in Isaiah 30, verse 1, and Hosea 4.12. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Was this Levite of Judah not a rebellious child? And he had cover, he, he was taking cover with a covering, but not of God's spirit. Was he then a true Levite? Was he walking in the path that God would have him to walk? Evidently not. <clears throat> Hosea 4.12. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them. For the spirit of whoredoms has caused them to err, 
and they have gone a whoring from under their God. If we're looking at what this man from Bethlehem, who claimed to be a Levite, was doing, he had left the house of bread, he'd come to Mount Ephraim, and is taken employment as a priest. Is this not the same as walking in a path contrary to what God would have them do? Yes. You know, Dwight, as I'm looking at stocks, I'm thinking of the stock exchange and all these investments, greedy of gain and their staff, their fellow employees or employers or board of directors, whoever it is. It's just laughable. Okay. Where is our inheritance today? Where was our inheritance at the time of this story in the book of Judges? Has it changed in any manner or in any way? The inheritance? Um, yes. No. Okay. If our inheritance is not changed, then why are we placing our faith in the things that will soon be destroyed? That's what this man from Bethlehem was doing. Now, Judges 18, 7. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure. There was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything, that they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. Rather than magistrate, they had no air of restraint. Is this not men that are dealing as they see fit rather than dealing with others as God would have them to deal with them. Um, so, on the, yeah. on the, on the Dan's, on the yes. Danites. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now. We have five men. Are they wise or are they foolish? I would say five foolish. All right. And they came unto their brethren to Zorah and Eshtau. And their brethren said unto them, what say ye? And they said, arise, that we may go up against them. For we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And are ye still? Be not slothful to go and to enter to possess the land. So they're getting ready to annex them. I would say yes. Well, that's but, what we do today. I mean, that's what we call it today. It's annexing. Okay, but did we not see before when the spies were sent into Canaan, 
that only Caleb and Joshua came back with a positive report. Yet here are five men of Dan coming back to their brethren, and they're saying, we can take the land that other tribes have already subdued. Why would they do this? Well, didn't it say they weren't satisfied with their coasts? Yep. They were having to battle. They were having to dispossess the Philistines. That was what was given to them by Lot. They did that was given to them by what? By Lot. By when oh yeah. Yeah, right. I get it. Okay. But did they want to take which was allotted to them? It would appear not. So as we continue. That kind of plays in line with the, uh, the reasoning, you know, uh, God wanted them to accept their punishment. Isn't that, isn't that what he, um, and then move on, basically. Okay. From the Babylonian, you know, the, at the Babylonian captivity, accept the, uh, what's going on. Because I've already told you this is what's going to go on. <laughs> Well, let, let's, let's look at this a little differently, too. Dan is given a specific portion of the land. Was the church not given Miller's rules in order to more properly understand Scripture? Yes, uh, what we can actually determine is like the Danites have, because they were on the coast, that's prime real estate. <laughs> and they were given uh, the Miller's uh, rules is uh, the prime way of understanding scriptures. Hmm. So they didn't want <clears throat> the prime real estate. <clears throat> They didn't want the seacoast because they were going to have to battle to defend it, to be able to take it, right? That's what it seems. So when the choices were being made that we were to set aside Millerites understandings, the Miller's rules, and begin accepting the Protestant teachings. We did it because others have already done the hard work. We just need to make this our own, rather than doing battle to take what has been allotted to us. I mean, if, <clears throat> let, let's look at it this way. If you have, let's say, the opportunity of being granted a home in Miami, but you have to do battle in order to gain it. Or you're going to be given a home in the wilderness of Alaska, and all you have to do is go take it, just walk into it, which would many people prefer to have? 
wouldn't they take the easy one versus the one they had to battle for? <clears throat> yeah, easy way out. Yeah. Judges 18.10. When you go, ye shall come unto a people, secure and to a large land, for God hath given it in your hands a place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. Is this not what Caleb and Joshua tried to tell all the other, all of the other tribes? Now you have the Danites coming in just a few hundred years later and saying we should take this of our brothers. And there went out from thence of the family of the Danites out of Zorah and out of Eshtile, 600 men girded with weapons of war. Twice the number of men that Gideon had. And they went up and they pitched in Kirjath Jerem in Judah, wherefore they called that place Mahana Dan unto this day. Behold, it is behind Kirjath Jerem. Now, how can you better pronounce this Mahana Dan? What? What does that have? What what should that mean to us today? Any thoughts? Is there a specific definition of this in the Hebrew? Yeah, I'm looking at that here. So, Machanedan, Machanedan, Machanedan. Uh, it's a place in Palestine. Um, It only occurs in Judges 18.12. So is that the item that's important or is it where it's behind? I don't know. Yeah, it just means the camp of Dan. Okay. <clears throat> But why would this camp of Dan be behind this city of okay. Kirjath Jerem? Hmm. What's being hidden here? Um, Dan is hiding in Judah. Right. Infiltrators. Is this um, uh, the Exeter camp meeting? The Waterton group? Well, <clears throat> no. Okay. It, no, I'm, I'm going to ask this. I mean, since this is this Kirjath Jerem is mm. city of forests or the city of towns. Yeah. It could very well be Exeter. Because Exeter was in a forest. Right. Yeah. 
that's that's what I was thinking there anyway. So if this is another example, another symbol for us of Exeter. Yeah, another thing about this word paragraph Jerem, it it has part of its name uh, Ya'ar, which is uh, the word means, which is a thicket, a, a copse of bushes, hence a forest, hence honey in the comb as hived in trees. Okay. So we could see there that word honey, which we've studied into. Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, that would take us to First Samuel 14 over, or where, I'm not quite sure if that's the right chapter, where, where Jonathan finds the honey and eats it when they were fighting the Philistines. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So are the Danites <clears throat> representationally showing us that they're acting as the Philistines in this example? I mean, they're not, they're not acting as they should as a tribe of Israel. They're acting as antagonists. They're looking to take the possession that was not allotted to them. Right. So is this, is this another representation of the church accepting Protestant teaching? Or the movement accepting Protestant teaching. Okay. And the method of, of uh, criticism, innuendo, gossip, all those types of things to further their ends. Well, especially if that is the movement being critical of others within the movement. Mm -hmm. hmm. Which is why the study that we did there in um, uh, chapter in Corinthians the other day. Right. Chapter. Chapters one and three. First Corinthians what? Angela? We oh. read portions of one and three. First Corinthians chapter one and three. Yeah, chapter three, divisions in the church. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, then is omitted from the list of tribes in Revelation. It's because, one of two tribes that are admitted out of out of Revelation. Yeah, because of being a backbiter. Well, I don't know if it's one of two tribes. I, uh, it is. Because we, we looked at... Uh, Ephraim and Dan. Well, Ephraim is Joseph, and Joseph is mentioned. But it's Joseph and Manasseh that are mentioned specifically. Yeah, I understand that. But Joseph is is Ephraim. Ephraim is sometimes referred to as Joseph. That's all I'm saying. So it's really just the one that's excluded, you know, completely is Dan. Right. Yeah. Now, and they the 600 passed thence unto Mount Ephraim and came unto the house of Micah. Beginning another section. Then answered the five that went to spy out the country of Laish and said unto their brethren, or the 600, 
Do ye know that there is in these houses an ephod and teraphim and a graven image and a molten image? Now, therefore, consider what ye have to do. According to the law of God, what should they have done? They should have destroyed them, but instead they... All of those things, the molten image, the graven image, or whatever it is, the teraphim, all those things, that guy, they should have killed him too. <laughs> Everybody that responded, I agree with you. But... <clears throat> As we continue, and they turned thitherward, and they came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even unto the house of Micah, and asked him of peace. Are they not giving him a peace and safety message? Symbolically, yes. Okay. The alternate readings for that verse. Genesis 43, 26. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present, which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to the earth. 43, 27. And he asked them of their welfare. And said, is your father well, the old man of whom ye spake? Is he yet alive? 1 Samuel 17, 22. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. David asked him of peace. So they've come unto the young man, the Levite, in the house of Micah. They have asked him of peace. And the 600 men appointed with their weapons of war, which were with the children of Dan, stood by the entering of the gate. So you have these warriors girded for war that are standing by the gate of the house. And the five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither and took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with the weapons of war. And these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod, the teraphim and the molten image. And then said to the priest, unto them, what do ye? And they said unto him, hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, and go with us, and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man? or that thou be a priest unto the tribe and a family in Israel. And the priest's heart was glad, and he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of the people. So they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle and the carriage before them. This young man, from Bethlehem. This man of Judah that claimed himself to be a Levite, who is being compensated by Micah, is now choosing to leave from this employment to become a priest unto a whole tribe.
What do you see in this portion of the story, symbolically or literally? Well, one thing I can see is a seminary grad who might be appointed over one church who's offered a bigger job or more churches elsewhere. Or is this the equivalent of a conference position? Yeah, could be. Of a conference position, is that what you said? That's what I said. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you know. Yeah. I, I just think that we have to look at this a lot closer to home, personally. We need to look at it very close to home. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that we need to start generating some lines. <laughs> yeah. Well, start putting it to that, that seven-step process and look at it much more carefully. These are some interesting things that you've brought out, Dwight. Well, it's an intriguing study so far. Mm. Yeah. So, and there's a lot more to do in this study. Yes, there is. So we'll, I guess we'll pick that up next week then. Right. Uh, you know, I had something rattling through my brain. Uh we're kind of starting to see what uh, Sister White mentioned as uh, like cause can't we don't recognize cause to effect, right? Um, and and this could quite possibly be exactly what you know she's talking about is seeing this cause and what the effect it had. I'm sorry, my bird's talking to me. If we're not willing to, to recognize from cause to effect, we're going to have a problem in understanding what the scripture is really saying to us. We need to be taking a look at all of these examples. Putting them on a line is a great suggestion but also looking at them in the light of God's word. Because the one thing that stood out to me so far is neither Micah nor the young man from Judah that claimed to be a Levite, nor the Danites were accepting of God's law. They were walking contrary to what had been put out as his covenant and as his testimony. Now, can we afford to be doing that at this time of earth's history? Um, no. So all of these items together have a lot to teach us. And we haven't even gotten into the meat of this portion of the study. We're just setting and beginning to set this up to be able to go in to look at the next sections. So I believe the... Uh, is it the American group that's going to be doing the, the study today or is it the Canadian group today? Yeah, Adelio is going to be presenting right away. Okay. So we're going to close this study and then be prepared for Odilio's study to see what, uh, what we can find. Uh, one comment from the chat. Ellen White in the 1888 materials in the sermon, The Need of Advancement warns against parasitic preachers whose funds should go to the worthy laborers. Good yeah, it's, it's the Canadian group that's presenting and Odilio's presenting there. Okay.
All right. So shall we close with prayer? Loving Father, we thank you for the many examples that you're giving us so that we may learn and avoid the traps that have gone before us. We pray, Father, for your guidance through this Sabbath. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon Odilio as he presents, that we may gather together come to learn and understand that which you would have us to understand. We pray also for Brother Stephen as he presents later today on tabled history. Help us that we may learn and be guided in all that you would have us to do. Direct us to this end. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.